When I was five, my parents bought my first bike for me, a cherry red CCM, 26 centimeters, three sizes too large. The bike was so big, my feet wouldn't reach the pedals from the seat, so I learned to ride that bike by straddling the top tube back and forth, back and forth. I wore the red paint off over time. And I remember when the bike was given to me, my mom noted that it was too big and dad simply said, he'll grow into it. And over time, I grew into it. When it comes to bikes, I guess I've never really grown out of it. At first I rode for the sheer joy of freedom, and then it was for the fun of it, and then to go fast, and then it was to ride with friends, and finally for fitness. But everything changed when I began riding for a cause. It all changed when I began riding for missions. I was in Zambia with our missionary partner Jacques van Bommel. We were using a helicopter to scout land as we were looking for locations for a base on the Zambezi to start Sunday school ministries there for children. From the air, it was raw and wild and beautiful and exciting. But from the ground, it broke my heart because the magnitude of the need was stunning. We were in a nameless village, six mud huts in a circle. It was like stepping back through the centuries. After three days of continuously talking about how we might crack the culture or reach the children, feed the hungry, I was absolutely overwhelmed. I turned to my host and said, Jacques, what am I doing here? I'm a local church pastor from North Carolina. And Jacques answered me with a question. He said, you don't see anybody else here, do you, pastor? That's when riding became far more than fun and friends or fitness. That's when riding a bike became connected to missions for me. I established Hope Ride, a team endurance ride in Africa to raise funding and to make a difference for kids. We ride for the children of Zambia, for kids along the Zambezi with almost no hope. That's where the gospel comes in. Without clean water, that's where the well drilling comes in. Without security, that's where sustainable farming techniques come in. We ride for children whose names appear on no record, who have almost no shot at an education, who will live to labor, but they will not thrive. We ride to raise money and awareness to bring hope and healing and clean water and help to a part of the world that's so easily forgotten. Hope Ride is an adventure. We've ridden with the elephants in Botswana and camped in the open in the Chobe wilderness. We've dodged the occasional ostrich or warthog or baboon along the road. We've battled sickness and mountains and wind and wrecks along the way. It's hard. It's thousands of miles of training. It's time and it's pain. And it's worth it. It's worth it for the friendships, the partnerships, the sponsorships that find a powerful synergy in sacrifice. It's worth it purely from a humanitarian point of view. It's worth it when after four years we've drilled more than 40 wells and currently serve around 2,000 children in Sunday schools up and down the Zambezi. It's worth it when you see lives changed by the gospel and love doing what only love can do. It's worth it when you look into the eyes of a child who can live, love, and hope for more than a laborer's existence in a world without dreams. I know what we're doing is only a drop in the bucket, but every flood begins with a single drop of water, and that's my hope, that's my earnest expectation. The scripture says, I will pour water on him who is thirsty, I will pour floods upon the dry ground. Help me make a difference. We can, we should, we must change the world. It's Hope Ride Sunday. Two weeks from today, I'll leave with my fifth Hope Ride team for South Africa. We'll begin at our Reaching a Generation base there and we'll travel north to Zambia, 620 miles in six days. And you see us starting there in the northern part of South Africa, through Botswana, through the Katrivi Neck, up into Zambia. And uh, we'll end up on the Zambezi River. 
We're sponsored by some awesome people, and I just wanted to take a moment and just say thank you to people who have come along and helped us underwrite the costs. First of all, of course, Calvary Church, Reaching a Generation, Fern Associates, Jason Bramlett Real Estate, Hobson Lawn and Landscape, Landmark Builders, who just built our building next door. I felt like I should ask them. And I should have asked them for more, but... Um, Joe Mama's mobile stages. You'll see a V on all of our kit and on all of our t-shirts. That's in remembrance of Vinci Varghese, who went home to be with Jesus this year, but who was an incredible young lady who had a missions heart and family here in the church has sponsored that patch and will we'll wear it proudly. Southern Heating and Air, Ethan Richardson Foundation, and also, although they're not listed here, Trek Bicycles here in Greensboro have helped us out also. Here's the team, just so you know who they are. Up on the left at the top, this is Jeff Fuchs, and Jeff is new to our Hope Ride team. He's got a great base. He's ridden a lot through the years. I've done some training with Jeff. He's ready to go. It's going to be an awesome year. I can't wait to just show him Africa. It's going to be a great experience for him. Next to him, you see Chuck Fur. All I can tell you is Chuck is just a beast on a bike. He is a, uh, he's a motor. He has a, he has a heart. He has a soul. He's a, a living human being, but once he starts pedaling, he's just a machine, and uh, he can go all day. He's been a 30-year training partner and friend and walked with me, and it's so cool that after all of these years, here we are uh, in Africa together. I'm there in the middle, and then up on the right-hand side, you'll see uh, Matt Rand. Matt takes care of all of our support. Matt's behind us. He watches out over us. He takes care of us at every stop. He's engaged in just about everything that we do. Plus, he has to drive 620 miles at around 20 miles an hour all day. Those of you who can't go 55, you are not cut out for the job. And then uh, on the right at the bottom, this is Jacques Van Bommel. Jacques is our missionary partner and so much more. Uh, he's opened uh, a whole world to us and uh, we share ministry together in the Southern Hemisphere in Africa. I'm very sensitive to the criticism that suggests that I have gotten a little bit carried away with Hope Ride. Uh, I'm really sensitive to that. I think that that is absolutely true. I, uh, I can only agree, yes, I am, I am totally carried away. Um, more than somewhat carried away, totally carried away with Hope Ride. I'm over the falls in a barrel. I, I know that. And it gives me great joy to know that what is in me is kind of leaking out of me. Even though some may think it being over the top, all I can say is no argument here. It is completely over the top. It is way out of proportion. I am completely out of control. To God be the glory. In 35 years of church life, I've had quite enough of manageable religion and a manageable deity. I think we somehow need to get back to miraculous religion and a wholehearted service to a God who blows all the margins out of our lives. And I can only say, I can only say, and not in response to criticism, in full agreement with criticism. You need to get out over the edge. You need to go over the falls in the barrel. You need to move out into that place where it's something that completely <laughs> dominates your life. You'll find God is waiting there with a plan for you. He was just waiting for you to step out in faith and do something crazy. Uh, you can take that as a word from the Lord or not, and I see several of you have decided to not. See, the Bible says that through Christ... I can do all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Therefore, through Christ who strengthens me, I believe I can change the world through an endurance bicycle event. I can change the world through an endurance cycling event. I believe it with all of my heart. It's already changed the world for this boy, one of the first to drink from a well that we drilled just a couple of years ago in Zambia. He had never, he had never had fresh water like this. In his life, he had drunk water out of the polluted and, and uh, 
what should I say? It's pest infested and dangerous Zambezi River, or he had drunk water that had come out of a ditch, a collection ditch someplace. He's drinking pure, clear water straight out of the ground, and he'd never experienced it in his life. And I can tell you, it changed his world. It's changed the world for these children who've received the gospel in one of our children's churches, or these kids who had never, they had never heard the gospel before. They sit on reed mats and they hear our team go through the simple truth of the gospel. It's changing their world. It's already changed the world for 40 villages in Zambia who receive regular children's church outreach ministries, clean water every day, and one day soon, by God's grace, they'll receive, receive church plants and beyond that education, a whole new destiny. So I believe we can change the world. We are changing the world. I want you to help me today change the world. And the seed that we have planted grows out of our pontoon Sunday schools. This is actually, see the kids singing and clapping. This is one of the pontoon Sunday schools. We were there, you see our, our blue Hope Ride t-shirts. We just pulled right up to the bank, cranked up the speakers. Children in Zambia have nothing like this, nothing like this. They have no amenities whatsoever. They have a t-shirt, they have a pair of shorts, they're ratty, they're torn. The few toys that they have, they've kind of created themselves. We show up with the children's church and the kids come and the, and the chief comes and the parents, they come and they love this. We provide also basic health care and fresh water wells. And as we are moving forward now, planting the children's churches, and eventually they will grow into full-fledged churches, we are standing before an unrealized harvest in western Zambia, a forgotten place, a, neg a neglected place that is far away from Lusaka. The eastern part of, of Zambia, the more populous part. That's where all of the resources go. And the western part is left to the tribes. It's left to the mud hut villages. And it's in this place that God has planted us. And in this place, we're seeing a remarkable harvest. I'm not suggesting for a moment that there are not more needy places in the world. You can find a place whose need is more desperate, I am sure. I can only testify of what happened to me there and how it has changed my life. When I think of West Zambia, a familiar word from Jeremiah 29 comes to mind. Verse 10, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back from this place for I know the plans that I have for you declares the Lord plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope that word was first given to a people we often take that verse and we individualize it there's nothing wrong with that. We're not going to hell for that. We're not violating any scriptural principles for that. But the context says that the scripture was written to an entire people. Not just to one, it was written to all. I know the plans that I have for you, not just individually, but as you make up a people, I know the plans that I have for you. And for those people, Jerusalem lay in rubble and the temple had been destroyed and the hot torch of Babylon had left a scorched earth across Israel. And the proud people of Israel had been dislocated. They had been taken off into exile hundreds and hundreds of miles away from the earth that God said, I'm this sacred ground I'm giving to you. And the people who were left in the land were left destitute and without leadership, without a nation, without walls, without worship, without a temple, without a priesthood, without an educated, without an educated strategy. They were stripped and they were left with almost nothing. This dislocation, this exile, 586 BC, would last for 70 years and 70 years is a lifetime. If you've never read your Bible this way, you need to understand in reading through even the history in the Old Testament, 586, when Jerusalem is utterly destroyed and the people are sent off into exile, into which the prophets write, Isaiah, or Isaiah writes, and Jeremiah writes, and Ezekiel writes, all of them writing during the period of the exile. The exile changed everything. It changed everything. Richard Hooker is a Hebrew theologian, and he said, Hebrew history was built on the promise 
of God to protect the Hebrews and use them for his purposes in human history. Their defeat and loss of the land promised to them by God seemed to imply that their faith in this promise was misplaced. This crisis, a form of cognitive dissonance, when your view of reality and reality itself don't match one another, cognitive dissonance, can precipitate the most profound despair and the most profound reworking of a worldview. For the Jews in Babylon, it did both. So as they're taken into captivity, they are overcome with a sense of hopelessness. And they begin to view the world differently. Up until 586 BC, we find absolutely no history of, of really a longing or desire for Messiah. Messiah, the whole concept of Messiah, that he would have been promised from the beginning, but he's not clearly understood by the Jews. He does not come clearly into their view until after the exile. It is during the exile that the people say, the kings who have led us before are not adequate to lead us forward. To lead us forward, the priesthood that led us before is not adequate to lead us forward. If God is going to give us the land again, we need leadership, real leadership, and who will lead us? And they begin to look to the scriptures and search for the anointed one, Messiah, who would come, and it was prophesied that he would sit on David's throne forever. Everything switches for the Jews and the way that they view the world before the exile and after the exile. During the exile, they are a hopeless, dislocated, displaced, refugee people. It's one thing, I think, to grasp the concept of hopelessness. It's quite another to feel its overwhelming weight, crushing the soul that was made to soar. Let me illustrate it this way. I may feel deep sadness when I hear of someone's stage four diagnosis or when I hear that a marriage reconciliation has failed or when I hear of an impending bankruptcy. My heart might be heavy for that, but it's something else altogether when I discover that I am in stage four or that I have been utterly abandoned or that I am facing foreclosure. All of a sudden, it becomes real to me. I enter into that suffering that I may have felt to some degree before, but not like the experience of it. It's the difference between sympathy and empathy. Sympathy is compassion and sorrow and pity for another. Have you ever felt deep sympathy for someone? I do. Are you a sympathetic sort of person? Does compassion rank high in your value system? When someone's going through something, do you go, oh, no. Do you feel it in your, your heart? You're experiencing the pangs of sympathy. Empathy is different. Empathy is to suddenly enter another's broken world feeling fully what they feel, where suddenly their suffering becomes your suffering. It's a heavy place to be. It's a dark place to be. It's a lonely place to be. And so it happened for me. In March of 2012, in a Zambian village with no name, where I encountered the perfect storm of hopelessness, a staggering sense of a need that was just too great. You talk about cognitive dissonance. I had an experience with cognitive dissonance. I was standing weighing all of the factors that stood against us being able to do anything effective in the Zambian culture, absolutely overwhelmed, somewhat blown away. We were in a nameless village. I, I touched in that moment a very real kind of hopelessness because I had seen that day 13-year-olds with a baby strapped to their back and another one in the belly at a water pump carrying water to the village, knowing that little girls born into that village would bear ba babies and they would carry water and they would help plant the fields. The children who were born generally, except that they grow up in the chief's family or unless they reach uh, a, a high place in the headman's home, they were probably going to be nothing more than just the farm laborers who carried out subsistence farming in very hard uh, circumstances. Life was hard. We were dealing with, uh, in that situation, you were dealing with 
uh, demonism and everything being under the thumb of the witch doctor. You were dealing with syncretism. You were dealing with you know, such incredible poverty, overwhelming poverty. I remember in the midst of all it, Jacques had taken me along because he said, Pastor, I want you to see Zambia. We're thinking about opening a base in Zambia. I want you to see it. And I've been involved with Jacques with a few projects and I love being around him. He's such an apostolic figure. I said, yeah, I want to be there. So I went and I'm standing in Zambia and I turned to him and without really even thinking about these things, this is what flowed out of my spirit. I turned to him and I said, Jacques, what am I doing here? And I meant it this way with all the sincerity of my heart. Here I am, a pastor from an Assemblies of God church in North Carolina. What can I do here? I don't even know where to begin here. How do you even begin to minister in this culture? Everything that we talked about, we heard reports about how it had been tried by this group or tried by that group, and it didn't work, and it failed over and over again. You hear how it failed. What am I doing here? It's a hopeless question. Have you ever been to that place in your life where you've just said, how in the world did I get here? How in the world did I arrive at this place? I never thought I would go through this. I never thought I would be there. Nine times out of ten, you are dealing with a sense of hopelessness, cognitive dissonance. My life wasn't supposed to turn out like this. Jacques, what am I doing here? It's the question, by the way, that God asked Elijah in the cave on Mount Horeb. You remember twice he asked him, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah responded with hopelessness. What are you doing? Well, I've been very zealous for you, Lord. I've been working very hard, and we've got no harvest whatsoever, and Jezebel is trying to kill me. And I called down fire, and I called down rain, and it didn't back her off one bit. She's going to kill me. What is my life worth? Kill me now. He prayed those prayers often. It was hopelessness that flowed out of him. It's Jezebel's after me. I'm the last man standing. No matter what I do, it's never enough. It's the question that you ask yourself when you find yourself in a hopeless situation. How did I get here and what should I do next? What am I doing here? So I asked it out loud. What am I doing here, Jacques? And where do I start? Witch doctors, a thousand years of culture, poverty, demonism, suicide, syncretism, multiple wives, child labor, gross immorality, and always everywhere, this asphyxiating clutch of hopelessness. What am I doing here, Jacques? And by now, if you saw the video, you know his response. He said, well, you don't see anybody else here, do you, Pastor? That moment changed my life. All my life was already transformed. I was already a follower of Jesus. I was a pastor. I was walking with God. But just because he changed you then doesn't mean he can't change you now. I loved, I loved what uh, Harold Carter said in a, in a message years ago. He said, I thank God that I'm saved once, but I've got to be converted a whole lot of times. <laughs> How many of you are in need of constant conversion? Well, I had a conversion experience. Conversion, I mean, he changed me. He dramatically changed me standing in a Zambian village when Jacques said, you don't see anybody else here, do you, Pastor? Up until that moment in time, doing the bike ride to raise missions money was an adventure. It was a good thing. It was an opportunity. It was a numer numerical goal. It motivated me to get on the bike. But that question changed everything for me on that first visit to Zambia. It became, and you can laugh at me all you want. You won't hurt my feelings at all. I know I'm completely over the falls in the barrel, okay? I know I'm already a goner, so ridicule can't even touch me. You can even doubt me today, and I got to tell you right now, I care very much about you, but I don't really care about the doubt. I just have to, I just have to tell you what I know and, and what I've experienced in all of this. Riding a bike became part of my calling. He said, that's absolutely ridiculous. Now you're going to tell us that when you ride a bike, it's because of your calling. Yeah. You got a problem with that? Take it up with the hip. Yeah. I hear Africa calling every day. I hear those kids every day. It's like a Macedonian for me. Macedonian call. Come over here and help us. That's what happened that day in my heart.
It's never happened any other place in the world. And I've been involved in other mission fields, but it never happened like this, where on that day when he said, you don't see anybody else here, I realized it was me. God had brought me there. God had put me there. He let me see everything that I could see. And now it was on me. Would I do what I could do? Would I take the next step? I have to tell you, when I ride, I think of kids. I think of kids who are drinking clean water today. I think of kids who are in Sunday school today who'd never heard of Sunday school four years ago in children's church. I think of kids who got some basic medical care. Some of them would be dead today, except you walked with us. And we've established some basic health care initiatives. I'm thinking about kids, in some of them in the drought would have starved. But there were, with the drilling of the wells, there's water available to plant sustainable gardens. And the sustainable gardens are keeping whole villages alive. I think about those types of things. You helped us. You helped us. We have, with God's help, done things as he has strengthened us that have changed the world. I hear Africa calling to do what I can do. Yeah, I'm over the top, I'm over the falls, I'm carried away, I'm completely out of, war, uh, of, of proportion, let me put it that way. But I've been challenged by God just to do what I can do and make a start. It's just a drop in the bucket, but as I said in the video, every flood starts with a drop. So I was inspired, I was inspired just to take the next step. And with God, that's all he needs right now. That's all he needs right now from you. He doesn't need the whole thing. All he needs right now is your next step. That's all he needs. He will not require another thing of you today except your next step. Good news. Good news. Whatever he has placed in your hand, that's, that's all you've got to deal with. You don't have to deal with the two months from now and three months, and this is going to happen, and we've got to do this, and we've got to go there. God deals with you today, and he wants to know today, are you ready to take the next step today? What's the next step that he has for you? It will lead you into the center of his will. That step will lead to the next step, which leads to the next step. And before long, your steps are tracking your destiny, a God-given destiny and purpose. He has a plan for you. But you only find that plan when you take the next step. See, because this is the truth. This is the truth. God has a plan. I wish I'd learned it sooner. I don't always have to have the plan because he does. I rebelled years ago. Uh, I rebelled against this whole thing where people would say, Pastor, what's your five-year plan for the church? I used to fudge around with that a little bit, and I'd say, well, and I'd think about the last great book I read and try and regurgitate something. I got a secret for you. Didn't have one. Still don't. You say, well, you can't build a building unless you have a plan. Yeah, that's one thing, but that's, that's, that's minor. That's sticks and bricks plan? You want a five-year plan? Next step. I take the next step. Sometimes the Lord lets me see two steps, sometimes three steps, but you know, I guess it's because, I guess it's because that's how I follow the Lord best, or, or maybe it's because that's just the way he wants to deal with me as David, but he just shows me the next one, and I have found every time I take the next step, he opens the next step. Every time I step through one door, he opens the next door. Every time I go out the window he's open, I find myself in a whole new world. If I will just take the next step. Following Jesus is simple. It starts with the next step. We make it far too complicated. I think the, the great fallacy of leadership theory as applied in the church is this notion that we hold sole responsibility for leadership. We, if we are going to lead, must first and foremost be totally sold out followers of Jesus. Followership comes before leadership. You will never be the leader that God wants you to be until you become the follower that he has called you to be. If you will become the follower he has called you to be, he will make you the leader that he wants you to be. He'll take you far beyond what you ever imagined. Followership is totally overlooked these days, and it's so important. You see, followership is what brings integrity to leadership. 
if as a leader I'm out there just winging it on my own, creating on my own, you may have reason to be shaken in your confidence in my leadership. But if you have confidence that I am sold out to following the voice of the Lord, you'll have no problem with my leadership. The followership grants integrity to my leadership. We just need to follow him because he has the plan. Sometimes he offers us a peek at the plan. It's like Moses on Mount Nebo. You can look over into the promised land. But no man lives beyond the responsibility of faithfully taking the next step. That's all he asks of you right now. The next step. You are, I am responsible for the next step. And this is, by the way, this is why giving breaks down for some people. They look down the road and they say, I'm going to need it then, so I can't give it now. God says, give it now and you'll have all that you need then. Am I scripturally correct on that? That was a half-hearted kind of... You know. It's kind of like, let me chew on that for a moment. No, something, most of us, we say, I can't give it now because I'm going to need it then. And God says, give it now and I will provide all that you need then. That's how he calls us. You see, the only obedience, the only obedience that really matters with God is the obedience that we show him today. You say, I'm going to be obedient next month. Who cares? I hope so, but really... Relevance? It's the big so what? What about today? I tell my wife, where is she? Oh, hi, hi. <laughs> I was looking for a moment and I, I didn't want to say anything to Debbie. <laughs> it's Sherry. Okay. I can tell my wife, I just want you to know, we're going through a difficult time right now, but in 30 days, I'm going to love you. By the way, some of you guys, just try that out and send me an email this week after you, they check you out of the emergency room. No, you say, well, that's ridiculous. Yes, it is. You see, love and passion for God and serving God comes down to today. Here's the opportunity. Here's the door. Next step. Take the next step. Because what you are doing as you take the next step is you are unlocking a whole destiny. And for me, it unlocked, well, a subcontinent. It's because I don't think Hope Ride is done when it comes to Zambia. I think that there are other doors that are about to open things that I couldn't even ask or imagine. I don't think it's done by a far stretch. I think that, that God's still it, but I can only find it one step at a time. God has a plan. He declares it to Jeremiah. He has a plan for desperate people, broken people, burned out people, dislocated people, hopeless people, helpless people. That's what I saw in the village. That's what just about weighed me down to the ground. That's what God called me to confront with one step of obedience at a time. See, God has the plan. That means God also has the power and God has the provision. But does he have a people who will step up and say, next step? Does he have a people who are willing to be carried away? Or do we want to make sure that we keep our lives neatly controlled. I'm just telling you, life's out there in the deep end. You can splash around in the kiddie pool all you want. It's a different thing when you begin to swim. It's a different thing when you have that moment. Suddenly, it's deeper than you are. I just, want to, I just want to pray for someone today. I'm challenging someone today. I'm hoping for someone today. Jump into the deep end. Jump into the deep end. I'm carried away. Are you carried away? We need to be carried away. Our cause is bigger than we are. Sherry, do you agree with me today? Thank you. I just need that sometimes. Jeremiah says of this plan, it answers your longing. This plan that God has, 
It answers your longing. He said in verse 10, I'm going to bring you back. That was the deepest longing of the Jews. They said, may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I forget Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem. Remember, they're out by the, they're out by the river and they hang their harps on the willow saying, how can we sing the songs of Zion in this, in this foreign land? The longing and the passion of their heart, the longing and the passion of their heart had been pulled from them. They'd been dislocated from it. And God says, I'm going to bring you back to that for which you are longing. I'll bring you back. You see, God promises to bring us into that place of rest and peace and fulfillment, to bring us to the place that we were looking for. He longs to bring us to that place where we're one step closer to home. And where he leads us, his power always follows and his provision is waiting where God leads us. By the way, wherever God leads you will be well beyond you. Well beyond you. I'm in over my head in so many ways. I sat uh, in general presbytery meetings this week for the first time. Part of becoming the assistant superintendent here in the state means that I serve on the National General Presbytery Board. I sat down you, with a book about this thick of all of these reports and all of this administration and legislative stuff that goes on within our movement. I was a duck out of water. You talk about somebody who didn't know what in the world they were doing. I had this moment. I had this moment where I really wanted to turn to Rick Ross and say, Rick, what in the world am I doing here? But the last time I did that. It kind of rocked my world, so I was kind of quiet. I'm in over my, I am in over my head in so many things. Thank the Lord. I don't know where I was going with that, but I feel good saying it. Jeremiah writes to an absolutely wrecked people, a ruined city, a portrait of catastrophe. He writes against the smoking ruins of multiplied thousands and thousands and thousands of lives. And he says, God says to you, I'm bringing you back. I'm going to answer your deepest longing. Secondly, this plan that God has for you, it's good. It's good. You look at your life right now and say, it's not good step by step according to his destiny leads you to good if it leads to god it leads to good he has good things for you how many of you just need something to look forward to in your life right now i don't know about you but i'm that way i love that little app on my phone that tells me days until I've got it all filled up. I can tell you how many days until my next vac vacation. I can tell you how many days until Hope Ride. I can tell you how many days until uh, birthdays and stuff like that. I've got them all in there listed every day. I can pop on that app and, hey, it's only this many. As I need, I'm driven by something to look forward to. I wish this morning that I could just give everyone here a coupon to go to Ruth's Chris and have a steak for lunch today. Now, I can't. <laughs> I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but okay. Anyways, I wish I could give you that coupon. Some of you say, Ruth, Chris, man, some of you are Longhorn folks. So Longhorn, Chick-fil-A, McDonald's, God help your souls. If whatever, whatever it is that really trips your trigger, I wish I could give you that today just so you'd walk out the door with something to look forward to. Because there's something about having something to look forward to. There's something about hope. There's something about, hey, that's good. And I'm here to tell you today by the authority, by the authority of the Scripture, God has something good for you. If Oral Roberts ever got it right, if you walk in obedience with God, something good is going to happen to you. Because that's his destiny for us. I know the plans that I have for you. They're for good and not for evil. And in that Zambian village, I felt evil. I felt evil like I had never felt it before. It was like there was something wrong with the air. It was just too heavy to breathe. I felt evil. I felt the presence of the witch doctors and the rise of alcoholism and the lack of everything and the crushing poverty. I felt evil in all of its faces. And I knew, and I think you know too, God's plans don't look anything like that. His plans are for good and not for evil. To give you a hope and a future. So the third thing is this, it's hope. It's hope. You say, you're just telling me have hope. 
I'm going to walk out the door like some blithering idiot saying, well, I have hope. I went to church this morning. That's exactly right. Walk out the door and know this, know this. If you will follow after him, you have reason for hope. You have hope awaiting. It's right outside. You can pick it up on your way out for nothing except your obedience. Say, I will follow you, Lord. You are destined for hope. You say, but oh, I've got such a track record. I've got such a history. It's not about where you've been. It's about where you go. We Christians are different. We're different. Most people in the world believe that they are the sum product of where they have been. Well, it's my environment made me this way. My mama made me this way. My daddy made me this way. My poverty made me this way. The stuff I went through made me this. I am a product of where I have been. As Christians, we are not affected so much by where we have been as we are affected by where we are going. It's the upward call of Christ Jesus. Hope calls us forward. 2012, I looked out over a village in a region that had no hope. It strangled dreams, no future. But I was seeing it all through natural eyes. 2012, March 2012, here's what we had. I'm sorry, here's what we didn't. We had no land. Didn't own a thing in Zambia. We had no ministry presence there. We had no staff full-time or volunteer. We had no vehicles. We had no team. We had no practical means to link a base in Zambia with a base in South Africa. Had no funds for projects. We had actually not envisioned really what those projects would look like because we, had, we weren't there yet. Uh, we had no well drilling rig. As a matter of fact, the idea of using water wells as our door into the community hadn't really crystallized. So we didn't have that. Jacques von Bommel had faith. If I've learned anything from anyone in life, I've learned faith from Jacques. Interesting character. Actually believes that God will do what he promises. One story. Let me see where I am because I'll come back to this. Okay. One story. <laughs> we're in Zambia, and one of the things Jacques said, he said, if we establish a work up here, we're going to need to be able to get between, it's 600 miles of bad, bad road. That's what we ride. Driving back and forth on that, it's an experience, believe me. It's about 16, 17 hours you don't want to drive. And so there's all of this distance, he said, for us to really do this, we're going to be, we're going to need to be able to move more freely. He said, it'd be great if we had a small plane. He said, as a matter of fact, we need a, we need a small plane. I'm going to pray that God will give us a plane. Well, that's great, Jacques. And Jacques said, and uh, I'm going to get my pilot's license. So he did. He came back from Zambia. He got his pilot's license didn't have the money for it. Miraculously, the money just showed up. People said, hey, that's a great thing you're doing, Jacques. Here, let me help you. And, and his, his flight stuff was all paid for. That's mir miraculous, isn't it? But here's what I love about Jacques. He fires up the grater that most of the time does not work. It sits there as a flower pot growing weeds. But he fires up the grater, and he goes out and he grades the runway. I arrive, next time I'm in, in at, at Shaquaru in South Africa, we're pulling in, and I look off to the right, and the moment I saw the clearing, I knew what it was. That's a runway, isn't it? He doesn't have a thing, and he's building the hangar, and he's shaping out the runway for the plane that he doesn't have, and a pilot's license that he hasn't received. How many of you would approach that in a different manner? Well, I got to tell you this, he did get his pilot's rating and miraculously the Lord comes along and provides an airplane that's today in the hangar and that's being used by four ministries in that entire region. Everything that Jacques envisioned it being used for, it's being used for and even more. That's the kind of thing that happens when you hang around Jacques. So I just listed all of the things that we didn't have. No land, no presence, no staff, no vehicles, no team, no means of linking the bases, no funds in the bank, no well drilling rig, 
uh, no, no real plan at that point, just beginning four years ago. I want to tell you what's there today. And I say all of this to God be the glory. Pull the screen. 2,300 children right now are being fed five days a week. Six schools, there are small schools there, not everybody gets to go, but those in school, six school farming projects are started. The water out of the well can sustain a garden through the drought, and they're having terrible drought, and the food out of the garden is feeding the children in the school who would be part of the statistics out in the countryside, in the villages, except for the sustainable farming methods that they've learned. 43 wells are drilled now. That's 43 villages in the lower Zambezi in the area that we're in. 16 riverfront children's churches are going right now. Two new sites are being launched this week. That means what you saw in the video when you saw the, the kids out there dancing and, and, and all of that. The pontoon's going to pull up in a brand new place and the kids are going to come and the adults are going to come and the chief has already been contacted and he will come. They'll all come down to the river and the children will have what for them is beyond Disney World based on what they have known to have something like this for them. And the adults stand there slack-jawed at the presentation of the gospel to the children and the children's teams loving on these kids and the opportunities that it opens up with the, with the wells. Between 1,600 and 2,000 children in children's churches, and yesterday Jacques said, when you give that figure, he said, help people understand. That's the best that we can count right now. We know that there are more. We know that there are more on a weekly basis basis. Let's go to the next slide. About 300 adults are being ministered to as well. This is the, this is the core, this is the crux of what will become a full-fledged church as God gives us grace and will send us the workers. 20 plus volunteer staff, most of whom have been saved now out of the children's churches. Adults who were saved through our children's church ministry are now working with our staff on the ground. We have 11 paid staff now in Zambia after four years. Some of them are just maintenance on the two bases, by the way, two bases that we have on the Zambezi. Some of them are just laborers and workers there, but we've got also some trained staff for gospel ministry and, and things that they are doing. 25,000 acres of land. We had nothing. I don't know about you, 25,000 acres. Every time I see that number, it absolutely blows me away. 25,000 acres. Unfortunately, we only have the use of it for 99 years. All land is reverted eventually back to the tribes. 99 years. That's okay. I can work with that. Because God only requires of me to take the next step. So what are you going to do with 25,000 acres? We're going to duplicate the model that we have in South Africa where game farming, we're going to raise up game farming. It might take five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years, but we're going to raise up that model because we know that that model can become an economic driver in the area. We know that we need to transform everything from the ground up. Uh, we have three four-wheel drive vehicles there. Let me just tell you about the vehicles church out in California heard about what we were doing in Zambia, said, that's really exciting. You guys are going to need vehicles, and we'd like to buy you some vehicles. Where would we buy them? Well, the only place you're going to be able to buy what they need at the right price would be South Africa. Okay, how are we going to get them up to Zambia? The church says, we'll send a team of people over there trained to do children's ministries. They will pick up the four-wheel drive vehicles, the brand new vehicles in South Africa. They'll drive them to Zambia. They'll get them through all of the checks and border crossings and taxes and all. They'll get them all the way there and the vehicles will be there. Then they'll fly out of Zambia and back home. And so brand new, three brand new four-wheel drive vehicles for the bases in Zambia, all donated. A $250,000 drilling rig. First one we had, $60,000 drilling rig. It didn't last hardly at all. We drilled, uh, we drilled a few successful boreholes and we were spending more time repairing the drill. We realized it just wasn't good enough. A donor in California came alongside and said, you know what? You guys are doing great work there. You need a better drill. What will it cost? It'll cost $250,000 for the right kind of drill. Okay, writes the check, $250,000, we own a drilling rig. Say, so how, pastor, how do you, I, not me. But when you are in step, as this other brother in California was in step, 
you keep moving towards the same destiny and all of God's providence and resource comes together at one place and one time and you go, how in the world did that happen? God always had a plan. God was always working out his plan. All he was looking for is faithful people to walk step by step in obedience before God and they were going to find the fullness of that plan. We've got two pontoons now. I've got a third one sitting in a barn over here that needs to be reconditioned. It's going to be sent over there also. I think there may be even a fourth one that's going. We need more pontoons because just above where we are, there's a pretty good falls and there's no way that we can minister up up the river without another pontoon Sunday school set up. And so all of the arrangements are being made now for the third pontoon. It's going to open up a whole new world on the upper Zambezi above the falls where we're going to be able to continue to do the same kind of ministry. Let me just tell you what's coming. This is from Jacques yesterday. All of this is as of yesterday. In the next 20 months, 30 plus children's churches will be planted. 90 to 100 new wills will be drilled. Third pontoon will be launched upriver above the falls. Six, those six school farming projects are going to be completely self-supporting in the next eight months. We won't have to augment them with food. They will grow the food that they need to take care of those needs. And I mentioned when you've got a well, then you've got water, you've got water, you just need manageable gardening techniques and that type of thing. When you've got people who can come in and teach them a way that is far more efficient than subsistence farming that they've known all of their lives, their small gardens can yield so much more. It's just an amazing thing what happens when God's people come together around a common cause and say, let's affect destiny. Let's change the world. Hope Ride is not singularly responsible for all of Zambia, but we are at the core of the Zambian project. What we do every year provides them with operational funds. Some are earmarked to drill the wells. Some go to the Sunday schools and operations. But we're changing the world. See, the Lord gives us windows and he gives us opportunities. In, 1990, in 1991, some of you responded with me to a challenge to an open window in Russia and Siberia to take a copy of God's Word into every school in Russia and give Russian school children the Word of God. And so we mobilized with churches across our nation. We mobilized and we sent over 15 years. I led 15 teams and we went all over Siberia. We said to One Hope, send us to the places no one else will go. And so we ended up in places in the middle of nowhere. And some of you, I look out there and I remember you from the city or the cities that we were in. The places that we went. I mean, on the other side of the world. And we took the gospel. And from taking the gospel and the planting of churches that followed, a very strong indigenous church grew up. And after about 12 or 13 years, the government began to crack down once again and try and shut out religious movements. And we found that our role was being diminished. But the church that was planted was so strong, they began to rise up and they began to evangelize their own culture. Indigenous church is what really makes the difference in the world. And so after 15 years, we had to step back. But when we stepped back, we found that there was a church that is planted that will not only survive, but will thrive in the face of Putin, in the, in the face of the oppression that's coming against them in a very fresh time. For us, there was a window that opened. It was a very small window. We stepped through. This Zambian project, it's a window. I have no idea how long it will remain open or how long it will remain effective, but for right now, it is a wide open door that the Lord has given us. And the last four years, I believe, have just allowed us to put in the foundation for things that are going to cause us to scratch our heads in wonder. And so now you want to know, how can I help? Because you want to go over the falls in the barrel, don't you? Aren't you tired of your mundane little life? Don't you want to just kind of launch out? Well, maybe, maybe you can become a hope writer. To do so, let me just give you the groundwork here. To become a hope writer, you want to get out there and ride with us, actually be one who goes over and rides, and that helps raise the funds. Um, you need to become a cyclist. If you ride your, your bicycle around the neighborhood, that's not going to cut it. You need to get serious about cycling. You need to become a C cyclist, a B cyclist, a B, B plus, and you need to get to the level of an A cyclist. You can understand all of those things later. Small potatoes, small details. But you need to become a, an A rider, and it will cost you. It's going to cost you. You're going to need to train between four and 6,000 miles per year on a bicycle. 
You say, well, thanks a lot. Thanks for nothing. But somebody, somebody, look, five Hope Riders have come out of this church. And there's more. I'm taking another one for the first time this year. There's more. And it could be that the Lord challenges your heart right now to say, you know, I would love to do that someday. Well, we can help you. Maybe you become a Hope Rider. Two, maybe you can help us, especially next year or even this year, but maybe you can help. We can't do more sponsors this year because we've already printed everything, but maybe you'll help us next year and become a sponsor or help us find sponsors because the sponsors this year have just about paid all of the expenses for shipping the bikes over with us, for the airfares, for, for the riders. Everything that we need is being covered by most of them businesses outside so that all of the donated money for the projects can go completely to the projects. Next year, I want to take sponsorship to a whole other level. I'm going to need sponsors. You know someone. You think someone might be interested. Send them my way. Help us with sponsors. Three, you can today, you can buy or you can order a t-shirt. You too can have this. Not me, the t-shirt. Well, not my t-shirt, but a t-shirt. If we run out, I'll give you mine. Or a hoodie or a mug. You want one of these mugs. I've got to tell you right now, forgive me. Shameless, shameless retail in the house of God. Throw him out of here. He's a money changer. Buy a Hope Ride mug. Jesus will forgive me. We need you to pray for us. The 21st of August through the 31st of August. We start riding on the 24th, but we travel on the 21st. We need your prayer support. We need you to pray for us every day. You know the history. I went to Africa I think it was the third Hope Ride. I lose track. I think it was the third Hope Ride. I got sicker than I have ever been sick in my entire life. It was absolutely horrific. They should have made a movie. It was epic. It was, it was a horror show. Awful. I need the covering of the prayers of God's people. I don't want to get sick this year. Last year, you know, I went down in an accident, ended up fracturing my pelvis in four places in my sacrum. And... Um, I don't want to go down this year. How many of you think that's reasonable? I need some of you to pray, Lord, you know our pastor, just help him to hold the bike upright. I don't want to be hit by a warthog. I don't want to be knocked down by an ostrich or vehicle. I don't want to be swept off the road by a truck that's passing too fast. I, I, I'm not looking for any of that. I'm going to have my head up. I'm going to be riding, but I need to stay upright. Pray for all of our team on these matters. We need you to pray for us as we travel. Pray for us as we're riding. And then finally, give. Give. There's a Hope Ride card that is in your bulletin. And um, it has a small piece on it, too. It's bigger than this one. It's perforated, so you can tear one piece off. We're asking you to pledge for Hope Ride or give today to Hope Ride. And here's how you do it. And uh, guys, if we could have the offering plates at the door. Yeah. We're good on that. Like, you guys are so far ahead of the curve. What I'm asking you to do is, it says, I pledge to give towards Hope Ride. It doesn't matter if it's small or big. It's, it's the step that you take. If, if you feel it in your heart, if you feel God, just take the step, whatever it is. 10, 20, 50, 100, 500 dollars. Uh, some, some put in the box. There's a box beside it that's, that's wide open. Several people have asked, what would it cost to put down a well? When we are in a remote, ultra-remote area, we'll put down a solar well because they require far less maintenance and that type of thing. But if we're really close to a large populous area, they come out and they steal the solar panels. So we've learned that when the closer we are to a populous area, we'll go in with the traditional pump well. We build a very, very, we take in a very, very sturdy project. And then we're checking all the time too to make sure that they keep functional. To drill and to put in a regular well is 3000 To put in a solar well is a little more than $4,000 if you're interested in putting down a well. And if you mark and earmark money for a well, it will go to the well. All of the project, though, here's the way it works. We go in to a village with the, if not the regional chief, we go into the head man and we say, we want to, we want to minister to your children. And we'll come and we'll put down a well for you. We will not put down a well in a place where they will not allow us to minister to the children. 
And so when they said they'll, they'll allow us to set up one of our Sunday schools, and we come behind that and we set up the well. And we engage, we involve ourselves in their lives because we, can, we know that the Lord has enabled us to make a great, great difference there. As you fill out a card, as the Lord directs you, you can drop an offering at the door. Anything that's given in the second offering will go completely towards Hope Ride. But the pledges are payable by the 11th of December, by the end of the fiscal year here. We need, this money needs to be out of our accounts and into reaching a generation. So help us. So help us. I believe this is going to be our greatest year. I believe this is absolutely going to be our greatest year. Bring the card. Keep the little piece for yourself. Put it in your Bible as a reminder to pray for us and as a reminder of what the Lord dropped in your heart today to give. But give us the larger part of the card. Leave that here for us. And that just gives us a, a record and an idea of what is coming in uh, in the days ahead. We won't hassle. We won't chase you or anything like that. This is between you and the Lord. But uh, we do want to know how to plan because God has great plans. And I'll close with this. I didn't take this picture. I wish I could say that this is a picture that I saw and I could tell you a story of this boy and I can't. But I can tell you that in several places in Botswana, I saw this. I saw this. A mother knelt by a ditch off the side of the road. All the drainage from the road rolls into the ditch. And all of the mess of animals and everything around all of that flowing into that ditch, that brown, muddy, filthy water. I saw a mother with a baby strapped to her back, dipping and drinking. And it broke my heart. And I thought that is absolutely one of the most awful things I've ever seen in my life. But I saw it again and again and again. And when we entered Zambia, it was all worse. The guys who were with me on the last trip can tell you, when we crossed out of Namibia and into Zambia, you could tell that you had entered into a place where the poverty was at a completely different level. It breaks your heart. We can make a difference. With something so silly as a bike ride, that's the thing that keeps amazing me about all of this. It doesn't matter what it is that God calls you to do. If you'll do it in his name, if you'll do it with faith in your heart, he'll use it for his glory. Sherry's gonna continue to play, to play and in the first service, she started playing this. I didn't know what she was going to play at the end of service, but she started playing this old hymn. Some of you recognize it, Rescue the Perishing. It took me back to missions convention in my church. I was six, seven, eight years old. As a little boy growing up in Eastern Canada, my first memory of hearing that song. And that song was played. It's indelibly stamped in my memory at the end of a missions service at our annual convention where a missionary from Africa had come and rolled out the snakeskin and had all of the slides and showed us, showed us the four-wheel vehicles going through the water and all of the missionary adventure stuff. And Sherry started playing it in the second service, and I almost had a breakdown. As I thought, Lord, seeds that you planted in my life kind of rumors and overtones and melodies when I was still a boy you're bringing to their fullness and fruition even now I think that's pretty amazing we can rescue the perishing will you pray with me for Hope Ride and if you want to talk anymore I'll be out at the Hope Ride table here at the close of service why don't you stand with me And as you finish those cards, just bring them up and lay them face down here on the table. We'll collect all of that later. Father, we pray for the unreached people groups of the world, especially for those in Zambia who have not heard the gospel, but who are so close to receiving revelation concerning a Savior who loves them so much. 
We pray, Lord, that you would bless this missionary endeavor. We pray that you would prepare the way. We pray that you would guard us, that you would guide us, that you would empower us. And we pray that you would take us far beyond what we have even begun to ask or imagine. Now to, unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or imagine according to his mighty power that's at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations. And would you say the amen with me this morning? May God bless you. Let's change the world.